Um, all right, <clears throat> so this is our talk, um, talking about Svelte, Java, Kotlin, JDBI, and SafeQL. Um, I was kind of hoping that it would be like a coherent thing, where be the, there would be one project that uses all of these things. That didn't happen, so we're going to be talking about each of these things kind of individually. Um, but there should be enough interesting material to, you know, keep us occupied. Um, hi, I'm Keith. I work at Shopify. I used to be a Java developer with some of the people that work here, that come here. Um, so even though I'm working on Rails now, I still enjoy using Java and Kotlin and JVM languages. So this is what I did as a project. And it came up as, like, maybe an interesting talking project. Okay, so... Oh, no, wait. How do you go? Here we go, next slide. Oh, yeah, so bait and switch. So that was the original title. There's going to be some changes. <laughs> I didn't get everything done. <laughs> so first of all, Svelte. Um, it's a nice front-end um, uh, language for making web apps. It's like single-page apps, kind of like React or Vue or, uh, things. Um, one main difference between Svelte, the new version 3, and previous other things like React and Vue is that it comes with a compiler and it works out dependencies at compile time. And it has this neat little hack where you can kind of like annotate your JavaScript and the compiler will pick up all the lines that have those kind of like live dependent updates and then it will create the dependency graph from those. Um, so because I didn't get that prepared, we're gonna be talking a little, little bit about Vue. We haven't covered that here much, so. That'll be a little good exposure to that. And then Svelte could be someone else another day. <laughs> TypeScript, um, that wasn't on the bill. So we're just going to throw that in there. <laughs> uh, Javelin, it's, uh, it's um, a Java framework. So that's kind of one of the major parts of this talk is, you know, we did a lot of uh, microservices with Spring. And there are some things that doesn't really need all of the power and flexibility of Spring. So Javelin is one of the kind of like micro Java frameworks. And I looked at a few of them, and Javelin kind of hit like a good medium sweet spot. Um, yeah, notice the spelling, because it's obviously about Java and not about Javelin, which is, looks more like this. <laughs> um, oh, OK. Uh, Kotlin, um, yeah, so as you know, Kotlin is a JVM language. Um, you can use it for Android and other projects. Um, and it's named after a place, and the place is here. Because I never actually learned where it was. Oh, where is it? Oh, here we are. So somewhere between Finland and Estonia near St. Petersburg, there is an island, this little island here, the island of Kotlin. So the developers that made it, that's where they're from, so that's what they named it. And now when you search for Kotlin, you always get the language and not the place. <laughs> JDBI. Um, so, you know, when I was working with the micro framework, it doesn't necessarily include the database things. You can kind of mix and match. So I had to find something to use with it. And I was looking around. There was like Juke was one. There was another thing called MyBatis. Um, and then JDBI wasn't as popular. It doesn't show up as much because it's kind of part of DropWizard, which was a framework that was around the same time as Spring, but much less popular. So it kind of got forgotten about. But JDBI, the actual database interface part, is pretty good. And again, it's like a medium sweet spot. Performance-wise, it's not better or worse. It's just kind of average. <laughs> Uh, SafeQL, so that's part of the main talk of this. Um, it's just uh, like a query library that I made um, just to scratch an itch for some of the things I didn't like about uh, JPA and Hibernate. Uh, Keith Kim, that's me. Uh, yeah, so I mentioned I work at Shopify now, but I still like doing stuff. And the date is correct, so. Oh, no, that's not right. <laughs> It's 2019, not 2910, so not quite, but yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so normally this stuff would come at the end where I talk about other stuff, but I'm going to get cover at the front so that I know exactly how much time I have for the rest of the things and we can go as long, as short as it needs to be. 
Um, so I made a site called Hacker News, which doesn't seem to be here anywhere, which is just, it, it's just the renderer for Hacker News. Um, so the main reason I made it was because I spend too much time reading Hacker News. And when you're paging through things, you always see the same stories over and over again, because it's sorted by, mixed by time and score. So this is either, you know, purely by time or purely by score, and then it cuts it by day. So if I read it yesterday, I don't need to see any of that again. Um, but then when you click on the actual links, it just opens pages that goes to the actual Hacker News page. And I do find I spend a lot less time on it, but then it also lets me know that there's like a lot less content on Hacker News than you think there is. It's just that you can't, you're kind of mixing through new stuff and old stuff all the time. <laughs> Which I guess is a good thing for websites if they want you to come back. Um, so this was made, made in Vue, um, and it does a little bit of a responsive thing. So it works well on your phone, which is another thing that I do. So when you load this page, it loads once, and then you can scroll down for days and then read it on your phone in the subway, which is where I do it. <laughs> and then I just like, you know, control click a bunch of tabs and read them between stations. <laughs> uh, yeah, the slide here. Oh, status pages me. So that's another thing. Oh, good, it's up. <laughs> <laughs> I know, it would kind of suck if a status page site was not up. Um, so again, this is also made in Vue. Um, and it has, like, I think, it has a Java Spring Boot backend it did. Um, and it uses JavaScript to parse uh, the status pages of all these different sites. And the most useful thing is that it aggregates where the things are. So, if I click on that, it takes me to their actual status page. Or if I want to find out what's going on, like something will take me to their Twitter. So it's a good collection of stuff. And it tries to keep a history of statuses and when they changed. So you kind of have like a history of, you know, whether they actually update their status ever <laughs> or if it's been green for, you know, five years. Um, and then you can click on here if you want to just subscribe to particular ones. You can just say which ones you want to see, and yeah, and then you have just those. So that's just in a browser cookie. It doesn't have any state. Uh, and any other interesting thing? Oh, yeah, okay, these two things. So this is when I was working at Helpful. It was a startup. Helpful, we kind of called it like a startup school. So we kind of did like a bunch of experiments, like, you know, funnels for conversions and things. And then so we kind of got the bug of like making products. So that's kind of one of the things I did was I took this search thing, um, which was made by Etsy. It's called Hound. So it's a Git uh, repo search. It actually works for other things too, like Mercurial. Um, but it's just based on uh, trigrams. And so it builds a trigram index. So it's really good at doing exact search, exact matches. So it's really fast. So I kind of built it out as like a, a hosted service, just to take an open source thing and host it. Um, it does work. I think this might, oh yeah, yeah. So I have to log in as demo. Oh yeah. Oh, there's no things, no. Oh, do I have to hit, hit enter? Oh, I guess I have to hit enter. But it's pretty fast. And so you can give it like file path you know, matches if you want to restrict it by that based on a regex, whether it's case sensitive or not, or specific repos if you want to just look for things. And can also do the, um, the GitHub uh, wikis, I guess, the markdown. And how's it go? Oh, yeah, and then I, made, I went all the way down to making like a, a landing page. No one signed up yet. <laughs> <laughs> but if you're interested, you can contact me. Uh, and quick log. Oh, yeah, so this was fun. So I kind of built this while I was at Healthful, and we used it. It was pretty good. So um, we send things to Logly or whatever your logging thing is. But the thing is, there's so many logs. And you, it was just a way. So we have our logs, and we have our metrics, which is like lots of detailed data. 
So this was just a way of tying together major events, like things that you might send to, you know, as an event to your data warehouse, like those kinds of events, high level ones. And it lets you connect those to logs. So I can look at a list of high level events like this. And if I click on one of these numbers, trace IDs, it will take you to your logging platform and would just find all the logs that match that trace. And it also displays, I don't know if you can really see here. Um, so this is the timestamp. This is who did the action, which could be like a person or another service. And then these columns are the other services that it talks to. So this is kind of like a sequence diagram if you read the, the log top to bottom. And then so you can see what's going on in terms of like the major events. And you can scroll and find your things. So it was pretty useful while we used it. This kind of grew out of, we started doing this by saving major events in a database table. And then Jonathan started that. It was a great idea because it was so easy to just to find a list of high level things. And then so it just, you know, I just took that and made it into a web thing and you can do kind of filtering and searching. And again, I did the landing page, no customers. <laughs> but this was really fun to make. Well, actually, no, Helpful was kind of like a non-paying customer. Yeah. Oh, OK, so we're, we're done that. And oh, no, back to here. OK. Ah, so view, right? So we're not talking about Spelt anymore. Oh, no, wait, there was a, good th there was a thing about Spelt. I forgot. Here, is this it? Here at, why is it two times? Thir Are those, uh, they look like timestamps. Time yeah, but there's two of them. So this was the article I read that got me really interested in Svelte. So this was kind of like the release announcement for Svelte version 3. And this is where they changed out how they do their reactivity computation and how they built the compiler for it. And it has a video. And somewhere around time marker 13 or 1532. Um, let's see. Uh, oh, wait, I think, was that it? No, that wasn't it. Uh, OK, so I'm not going to find it. But basically, it talks about how your uh, front end app is basically like a spreadsheet. And all the data values are like cells in a spreadsheet. And they're all just connected by back references to values that it depends on. So what the compiler does is find all the lines in your source where it has an expression that depends on something and then builds the binding at compile time. And then at runtime, it just has like a little annotation where it will do a translation. And it will replace your expression and assignment with an expression and invalidation so that it updates other things. Yeah. OK. So Vue um, so it was made by this guy, Evan Yu, uh, who, who used to work at Google. And he worked on, at Google making projects with Angular. And so he kind of liked Angular. There were lots of parts that he liked. But there were some parts he didn't like. And then when React came out, there was parts of React that he liked. So basically, he took the best parts of Angular and React that he liked and combined them to create Vue. Um, one thing that I like about Vue compared to other things is that it keeps the UI parts and the code parts separate. And you can do that with any language, right? If you're, as long as you, you know, restrict yourself to doing it. But with React, because your logic language is JavaScript and JSX is just inline, it's just too natural to make functions that return fragments and everything, and everyone does it. Um, Angular is just a lot easier to create a template um, and just have like the um, keep keep the separation of presentation and logic. Um, and then combined with TypeScript, it's super easy. Um, so it has a pretty small core. Um, yeah, some people try to use it with like a central store and like kind of the whole Redux. You don't have to. There's other things. Um, View stash is one that I use. It's kind of like, like, like an event bus for uh, a data store. So it doesn't have to be a central store. So any store can have like an event bus, and anything can subs subscribe to it. So it's kind of like more lightweight. Oh, yeah, so there's source for some of these things. So Hacker News. Oh, yeah, OK, so I think that's in view. 
so we can actually see some of it. Um, yeah, so it's not that complicated. There's like, there's a public that has the index HTML, and all it does, yeah, so that's just like, uh, yeah, so here, this div that says ID app, so that will get replaced by whatever the view renders. And then you go to your source, and then there's like the main. Um, so this is where I say mount this view element in that app, so it's all connected. Um, this is the, the state for this object. Um, and so because I put it here, it's kind of like my global state. And then I connect it through this uh, view stash. I don't remember what view script is. And then there's routes. So you can declare your routes. So there's like hash or slash about takes me to the about page. And then slash takes me to home. And home is this component, which is defined here in views. So I'm not sure why there's a separation of views and components. I guess the idea is that views are like higher level components, and components might be like, you know, the small elements. So, okay, so here, this is what your, you know, all your view components are gonna look like this. It has a template, which is what you're rendering. And because of its form, you, you, you're really not, you know, encouraged or it's not fun to put a lot of logic there. Um, so it does have um, conditionals and looping that you can put in there. So that's the part that's kind of like Angular. Um, and then in here, you can reference any functions from the body part. And then this is what they call a, a single file component. So you have both the rendering and the, the logic in one place. And you can also have CSS here as well. So it's one file has all the things relevant to that component. Um, and th these component files have the extension .vue, V-U-E. Um, yeah, and then this is, uh, yeah, so I guess this is a new way of rendering things, where it's a component that has other components. Oh yeah, so this just kind of declares the components you're using. And then these, so the components turn into tags. And then so you just pass parameters into your tags. And the way that you do the um, passing the props back and forth is really nice too. Like normal things, you just put in like squiggles, so those will be the values going in. And if you have an at sign something, those will be the events for values coming out. Yeah. So it's really lightweight to do the binding. Like there's not a lot of like, you know, uh, boilerplate. And then in here, there's like some components. Oh yeah, so this was a Hacker News uh, page. So it's just basically one long render. Um, but you can see how like the top part, it's basically top to bottom what you see on the page. So there has a very high one-to-one -one correspondence. Um, and yeah, it, you're encouraged to do that. And you don't really get into a lot of trouble because it's so cheap to make extra components that if you need to switch or something, you just like make it into a component. And then you just call it from a tag. So template is kind of like, uh, it's a fake tag if you need to do some logic, because all the logic happens inside the tags. So sometimes you need a tag where there's no tag. So you just use template so you can add the logic there. So here we can see that there's, uh, so this is all regular HTML. Um, the double curlies give you expression evaluation. Um, oh yeah, so. If you say style equals something, that'll be like the HTML style. If you say colon style something, this is HTML style, but the, the content's dynamic. Um, yeah, so here's like a conditional. So this entire div here is conditional on this. So it's pretty easy to read. Um, and then there's like a looping construct here somewhere. Oh yeah, here's a four. So you can put them in a template or you can put them on an actual tag. So this gets rendered as a table and then each table row is rendered for each row. Uh, oh, I think this is a row number. 
Yeah, so for each story in stories, and I also get the row number from it. And then this key thing is just a performance optimization for doing the DOM diff, so that if you re-render and it has the same key, then it knows that it can reuse the same element that it re-rendered last time. So there's fewer things to update in the browser. And there, yeah, using the keys gives you a huge performance boost. There was like a, a performance comparison between React, React with key, View with key, and Preact. And like using a key was like the most important thing for performance. Um, yeah, so there's no other, no other components and things in here. It's a pretty straightforward thing. Oh, but you can see where the code is. Um, so here, this is in TypeScript. These are properties. So these are uh, properties of the component. Oh yeah, so it has lifecycle things. Mounted is what happens. So the first time it renders, it does this calculation, and it does a, a load. Uh, tick is just a timer. It updates a little clock that shows. So if it's late, you should go to bed. Um, so there's like sort, load, and then I think in here somewhere there was a, where it uses that view store. It's probably, oh here, yeah, toggle story source. Oh yeah, yeah, so here, there's these different sources. Oh, this is just a name. Okay, so somewhere else it must use the names to figure out what the actual source is. Uh, okay. Columns. Yeah, so this is all type, just regular JavaScript TypeScript. Oh, yeah, one thing that it does is a little bit weird is that every line of that page is a separate HTTP request. Wow. <laughs> um, yeah, um, yeah. so it's just calling this Hacker News Firebase backend directly. Um, and I think there's a cache behind it. So even if I'm hitting that, every story gets a request, it's all going to be in their cache. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, you can see when it loads. You can see how like the story, when the data comes in, it gets inserted in place. So you can see how it kind of like expands and fills in interleavingly. And if you're on a slow connection, it's really annoying because the thing you're reading keeps moving. <laughs> um, okay, so that was like, you know, the first intro to Vue. Um, what do you think, what do you guys think of it? When Vue always put the, the like TypeScript component logic in the same file. I do, you don't have to. Okay. Um, yeah, some people keep it separate. They like, have, like all their CSS in one place. But I just love having single file, single component. Yeah. And actually, you don't even have to use the, um, everything that Vue does, it actually is just built with like JavaScript code. So you could do it with pure code. So you can create elements, you can create components, you can do that all with just pure code. It's just that it has that template rendering if you want to use it. So what is this? Oh, OK. So TypeScript, that was our bonus topic. Um, yeah, so I got into this thing at work where I had this pick up and store um, had these different types. So it was like options. You could say, I want to pick it up immediately, or it'll be ready in zero to two hours. It'll be ready in two to four hours. So I just wanted to make an enum, right? Something that you do in Java. And then so I was trying to figure out how to make a TypeScript enum. And it turned out to be this big rabbit hole that I just <laughs> dove and chased. And there was pretty much no good answer, but I did find this announcement news, because it's not in the rev regular reference docs, but in the release notes for TypeScript 2.9, they talk about this extra stuff they did for string valued enums. Because normally enums in, I guess, the TypeScript one, which was probably done like way early, just came out with like C enums, where they're just integers. And you have like names to reference the integers. But then they came up with string valued enums, which was like a new thing. But then even then it didn't work so well. So then 2.9 came up with this extra thing that makes it a little bit nicer. So this was like the original kind of enum. 
where you say enum type. Oh, yes, yes, sorry, yeah, yeah. Oh, actually, uh, here. Oh, oh shoot. <laughs> Yes. There we go. Ah, yeah. So this was like the first kind of enum, where you say enum and then the name. And then it would give you these names that you could use. And if you don't put the equals value, then you just get integer values as your enum values. If you say equal string, then using this name, so you would use it like pickup time value dot immediately would just resolve to the string. So just a symbolic representation of that. Um, when it runs through the transpiler to JavaScript, what you get looks like, oh. Oh, do you know what we're talking about? No, not this one. There was like a JS fiddle type code pen sort of thing. Hmm, what's that? No, close, close, close. Okay, that's close. Um, hmm. Okay, wait, let me see, maybe it's, maybe it's on the slide. So is there like another slide? No. Hmm. Where does that go? No, I don't think so. Oh, it's too bad. Okay. So I can describe it, it's not that hard. Um, <coughs> Oh, it's right there. Jeez. <laughs> OK. <laughs> so I had a code pen thing that says what gets generated from this. <laughs> um, yeah, so when you write this, it just turns into this JavaScript. So all it does is create this object. And it has these uh, fields. That's really all it does. Um, so the other thing that TypeScript has is you, where you can represent types as uh, so this means that this type can it means a variable of this type can have exactly one of these three values. So that's like that what was it the abstract data type or whatever or algebraic data types. So this is a sum type. So this type can have one of these values. Um, if I wanted to also allow it to be null or undefined, I have to include it separately. Otherwise, they're, they're not valid values in the type. So this is the other way of representing types in TypeScript, which is the preferred way for doing lots of things. But this way of doing effectively an enum when you have a sum type, and this way of doing an enum are not really compatible, but you kind of want a bit of both. This one is more, more useful for just declaring types and using them in your signatures. But this one is useful because you have names that you can use with it. Um, you can iterate through them. You can do other fun things with it. So I was just trying to come up with a way to combine this and that. And piecing together little bits of code here and there, and then looking at that TypeScript 2.9 doc came up with this is how you do it without repeating yourself. So yeah, so this expression will generate the equivalent of saying this type name is this sum type, which will extract from these values. And it does that by saying that this type is the type of this, which is an object, and it's indexed by its key type. And then so if you index an object by its key type, you'll get its value type. So these are all going to be values. 
So in this case, this would be a union of string and integer, because there's a number here and a string there. But I only want the string ones, so I say the intersection with string. And then that will give me just these types. And the reason I wanted to do that was because in here, you could also have functions. And I don't want functions to be part of my enum. So there is a solution that was a fun little rabbit hole that I wasn't expecting to go into. But there is kind of like a workable solution. So I think that's it for our bonus topic. But yeah, TypeScript, I love it. You can kind of pretend it's JavaScript. And when you're in IntelliJ, you can just like, you know, do all the refactor things, copy paste, all the little code hints. All right, so I guess we get down to the main part. Does the world need another ORM? No, <laughs> it doesn't, but I do. <laughs> um, so yeah, I just wanted to play with it, uh, scratch an itch, see, see where it would go. Oh. Oh, no, 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 there's more. <laughs> OK, so why? Oh, yeah, so this was kind of like the motivations. Um, yeah, so using Spring Boot, there was like a number of things that were annoying. Um, Spring JPA, Hibernate. I especially do not like Hibernate. <laughs> it has like lots of idiosyncrasies that don't really fit with the way that I want to write services. It's kind of like, you know, you're making transactions that are short, um, you do things, the request comes in. When I make queries, I want it to execute, I don't want it to cache, I don't want it to do extra clever, smart things. Um, yeah, and I don't want it to be like, you know, managed by this entity manager that you kind of have to like fool with every now and then. Uh, yeah, JPQL, that's also annoying. Um, just because I know and like SQL, and JPQL is another way of representing the same thing, you can do some cool things, um, but it would be nicer if you could do those cool things with just regular SQL queries. So you kind of have to choose one or the other. You can't have both. Um, performance, I think everyone's seen this probably before. This call stack. <laughs> um, this, this is probably an infamous call stack. Um, but, oh, yeah, there's probably a higher res version of it somewhere. But, yeah, this, this is like Tomcat here. And then this part, I don't know what this ACEI. That's the old name for Spring Security. Oh, okay. All right. And then here's like the regular Spring parts. Um, and then, okay, so now here we're getting to actual data parts. <laughs> this, is, this is Hibernate. This is where all the magic happens. Um, and then JDBC. So JDBC is fine. And you could use like JDBC template, that would be fine also. But all this other stuff, um, somewhere in here, there's like caching of query forms, which can cause garbage collection problems and other fun things. So yeah. Um, oh yeah, so this was like the really weird stuff about Hibernate that I found really annoying. So like how it will have delayed execution. You know, you say, save this thing. And it says, OK, I got it. And then later you do a read, and then it says it failed to write because your write didn't get flushed. <laughs> and by that time, your call stack is somewhere else. You don't even know where the code was that did the write. Um, and then we had this one particularly bad case where we would read uh, an object from the database. And we're using Postgres, so the default timestamp resolution is like microseconds. And then so we read it into an instant, which got rounded to milliseconds. And then so later on, when the transaction's closing, it notices, oh, the value's different than when it was read. Let me write that back. But it was also the version column. So it does the write where value equals. And it doesn't exist. And it's saying, oh, the, the thing's <laughs> deleted. So your uh, you know, optimistic locking broke. And so it took forever to figure this out. So the reads were rounding. Closing the transaction would try to flush it. And all I did was read it. <laughs> so yeah. Um, they did seem to improve it, though. It doesn't do that anymore. I think um, when you use an instant with a database now, I think it preserves the microseconds. But yeah. And then there's other things. Oh, yeah, the, the accidental modifies are really annoying, where everything by default is managed by your entity manager. So anytime you read it, it's great. If you just update a field, it's like, oh, you mean to change that. OK, we'll save that for you later when the transaction ends. 
but sometimes all you need to do is format it for returning to, you know, through the request. So you format it, you return it, and it gets saved. <laughs> um, so if you do that, then you have to call detach to tell the entity manager, oh, don't manage this anymore. So it's like, okay, why do all that? Um, and it's nice to be able to find all the places where things get saved. So you can't do that. You can't search for save. It's just any time a field gets touched. Uh, yeah, slow tests were a killer. Um, so you just have like, you know, a unit tests that use the data store and the spring startup for doing a unit test. And there's like ways to make it faster, but it's so much effort um, to get that to load fast. So my first experiment of not using Spring Boot was for the helpful Twilio relay service. So this was like an audio um, relay because Twilio had like a limit of 50 or something um, number of people that could be in a single audio conference. And we knew that there would be like a lot of listeners who are not participating, just listening. So we wanted to make like a you know, listen only stream. So that's basically what this relay service did is it was like a Twilio user that would connect to the Twilio conference, but then take the audio and then just broadcast it. Um, so we used, um, oh, it's a link, it goes somewhere. Uh, oh yeah, so this isn't the actual service, but this was like a you know, proof of concept that we did. We took this Spark Java microframework, um, tried it with Postgres, because that's kind of what we would be using. SQL to O is like a different object mapper. Um, and tried it out, it worked, and the uh, startup time was great. It was like one and a half seconds. <laughs> and so that's for the actual service. Um, so we ended up keeping that. But this particular framework was pretty bad in that your app is basically a static main and you have methods, like every, it feels very much like um, Sinatra, where you don't really get a lot of thing, or like Node Express, very, you know, just basic routing, and then everything else you have to do yourself, like everything is here, you really get no help at all. SQL to O was another library that was uh, not really mature, um, it has like a lot of like global state, um, so, you know, some bad things, but for this tiny microservice that did exactly one thing, it was okay but I wouldn't use it again, so that's when I started looking for other things. Oh yeah, Spring Boot is a sports car built on top of an SUV. <laughs> yeah, um, oh, is that a link? Does that go somewhere? Oh, okay, so yeah, this is another thread that I was reading about ORMs, how people like things, don't like things, and it's kind of like, you know, some of the same feelings that I have about stuff. And then so that kind of motivated me after reading that to try to make something. Oh yeah, okay, oh, I have lots of notes. All right, so yeah, number of conclusions. Okay. Okay, it comes down to a few things. So embrace SQL. Um, yeah, DSLs are kind of nice, but when it obscures you know, what it's actually doing, um, it's not good. It's good for simple queries where you can say dot something, dot something, you get the help, and you just fill it in. But when you write a complex query, I can't tell if the query is doing what I think it's doing. Because it's very, like, nested, and the hierarchy of combinations aren't visible. Because instead of saying, you know, it's a union of this and this, it kind of looks like query this, and do this other thing, and it looks like it's nested, but it's not, it's really a sibling. Um, so you want the structure of your query to look like the actual structure of the query that the database would execute. Um, yeah, you want it to handle joins, because I mean, if you get that wrong, it's really bad, and it's inconvenient to have to, you know, say equal, equal, equal for a multi-column join. Um, you want it to fetch relations. Um, yeah, a lot of ORMs fail on the n plus one queries, where, Sometimes you do want to query the main thing, and then as each object is referenced, because maybe most of them won't get referenced, you want to load that thing lazily. But sometimes you know that, for instance, in a service, I query 100 things, and I'm going to render all 100 things. 
So I don't want to query all the sub things one by one. I just want to do it all at once. Um, and even Rails, which is like, you know, probably one of the best ORMs out there, even it has trouble preloading things. Um, we have to make custom preloaders. And it just doesn't seem necessary. And the main reason is that you're dealing with objects when really you should be dealing with sets of objects. So if I you know, query you know, 10 accounts and I say, OK, I want their account owners, right? I want all the owners for all the accounts. So I just want to make one query as an expression of sets. Um, async composability, that's like a big bonus feature, um, which we had to do for some of our services where the queries were long and doing them one at a time um, just adds to the total time. But if you know enough information to start two queries in parallel, do them in parallel. And then so if you have a way of you know, spawning off those queries and then collecting them at the end and then putting together the response, that's a good way to work. So I just wanted to be able to do it nicely. Um, so those were kind of like the basic requirements. And there were a few other idiosyncrasies just to try to avoid. Oh, OK, I don't know if that comment goes anywhere. Oh, I, oh actually, actually, I think this whole excerpt probably is a comment from that Hacker News thread. Oh, yeah, OK, so this was, oh, yeah, so I did look at a bunch of microframeworks. So Spark Java, that was like the first thing to, we found. And that was kind of like just by random arbitrary choice, just roll the dice, pick one. Javelin IO was did a little more research, looked reasonable. Micronaut is kind of like a new one that tries to do everything. So it's basically they're just going to redo everything that Spring did. But it's going to be less popular but newer, so I don't know. <laughs> um, I did play with this composure, composure and liberator. Um, not very much, just enough to try a little bit of closure and the library. And it kind of feels, again, like Sinatra, where it's just a lightweight router and uh, you kind of do you know, regular queries. I didn't do anything much on these ones. This is like a, I'm kind of thinking it's kind of like Node or Vertex or something, kind of like more event driven. It's a Kotlin KTOR thing. And then Play, um, I guess some people might have experience with that. Um, Scala Java framework, it's also popular. Uh, yeah, this is not so useful, but fun. <laughs> um, it just, the one good thing it has is it has a like, list of frameworks you've never heard of. And it has it, you can filter it by all sorts of things. You can filter it by language, um, the database that the test sample is using, uh, different kinds of performance, like latencies. And you can sort by different things, like what has the worst max case latency. Um, so the absolute numbers aren't really so useful, but what is useful is just to seeing where you are on the scale, right? So, you know, things in the middle, there's like everything's in the middle. So even PHP is here, we're going to find Spring in here. Um, yeah, so Micronaut is here, Node is here. Some things are kind of on the slower end. Yeah, so here's some Hibernate thing. So it's kind of like in the range. So you just want to know, like, you know, am I off, off by a factor of 10, or where are we approximately? Um, so that kind of helped me find you know, frameworks to investigate. I did find another one in here. There was like a, a framework called uh, Lucky, which was kind of like Rails, but it runs on this compiled language called Crystal, which is basically Ruby with type inference and compiled to a single binary. But the compile times were terrible, <laughs> so you can't really do development with it. Oh, yeah, so before I made this talk, I had to make this spreadsheet because I couldn't remember what repos I had where. <laughs> so this is really good because <laughs> I spread things out over GitHub, GitLab, Bitbucket. And then, and then I have, like, I'll take the same application and I'll port it to different libraries. So if I look for status pages, like which flavor of status pages, I've even gone and started to do work porting something and then later found the repo where I'd already ported it. <laughs> so yeah. Um, there's like a bunch of things, mostly front-end frameworks and 
frameworks, a little bit of Jack backend frameworks. Um, so now if I'm, you know, figure out, okay, what have I done? Oh, there's this Go thing or this Java thing. So yeah, if you have a lot of repos, I recommend you do that. <laughs> Yeah, so Javelin, it's kind of like Spring Boot, but lighter. And especially if you're deploying to the cloud and you have a lot of like other infrastructure, like you have load balancers, you have security, you have an edge server. So you don't need all the features of Spring Boot in every app that you deploy because you're going to get all that surrounding support. So you can use like a framework that's not as feature complete and still have all, your, uh, all the things that you need. Um, yeah, it's fit. I don't know when exactly what the date is, but it doesn't really have any cruft. Um, even since the time that I started doing it, and now they've improved like the Kotlin support, so we'll see what that looks like. Um, yeah, so it's not quite as popular, but it's very easy to work with. Okay, uh, okay so maybe we should look at this a little bit before we get into the other thing. So. Uh, this. Looks like it's a Kotlin, yeah. Okay. Can people read that okay? Um, yeah, so this is, so this is Kotlin. Uh, yeah, the main function. So it doesn't use any kind of dependency de injection, so we just pass everything in. Um, this just configures the object mapper. Looks pretty familiar to the same thing that you might do in Spring Boot. This just creates the listener. Um, this is just uh, connecting, creating a connection pool for the database. Um, here, it's using JDBI. So that's the part that was chosen to mesh with Javelin. So Javelin just does the web routing part and uh, the response rendering. And then so here, this is basically the route so we're saying that this app that we created, I want to give it this route. And so it doesn't take any parameters. Here, if I go into here, if you say get services, it's going to call list on the service controller. And so list will just query the parameters out of the context. So here it takes a visibility parameter with a default of public. And then it will call this DAO thing. So this looks a lot like Spring Boot. Um, you have a query. Um, oh yeah, so this is where the, the Kotlin integration is really good, is you don't have to annotate anything. It just says visibility is a string, so I can just say colon visibility and it's going to work it out. Um, if this was like a more complex type, you can even do colon visibility dot and then something and it'll figure that out. Um, yeah, and then so you just say render um, the object that I got back. And then in here, okay, so this part is the JDBI part. Uh, oh, here. Oh, okay, so that's what we were looking at. Um, okay, but there's a little bit of magic that we're not seeing. Where, oh, okay, right. So this is, this JDBI variable has the connection pool. It's related to the connection pool. It has a reference to it. And then we say on demand this class. And then so we get uh, an instance that can make the queries that's defined in this interface. And then so we make the queries against this. Um, so this is fairly easy to use. Um, and then we have uh, path parameters. You can have query strings, um, normal things. I don't know. What's this, what's this post look like? Oh, it's not done. Oh. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I think I did have another version of it somewhere. I might not be looking at the right one. But yeah, it's just going to have a thing to read the body from the context and the request and then do stuff with it. Um, 
Yeah, so there's not a whole lot here. Uh, you can structure this better if you want. You can you know, split up uh, you know, registration of these things so it's not in one big file. So, but it's up to you to decide how you want to divide things up. But the startup time is pretty good. Here, let's see. Uh, so this is the app. So started. Oh yeah, so there it was running. It's listening. So if I query that from somewhere. No? Uh, uh, yeah, oh. I think I had like a little thing to, uh, yeah. So it does kind of what you expect. Yeah, I think that's what it said. Yeah, it's hard to tell. Yeah. Oh yeah, the other reason that Spring Boot's not really suitable for some of my projects is because I have like a VM and I'll put like a bunch of projects on there and I'll run out of memory if I try to run too many at once. So it's nice to have like a light framework for doing simple things. the presentation. Yep. Mm, okay, so for the query part, what are some of the things that I you know, want or don't want? Um, yeah, so basically the things that I didn't like about JPA or Hibernate, um, I want to be able to naturally use SQL, but use it in like a type safe language. So be able to turn SQL into Java typed expressions was kind of like the main thing that I would like. Um, make it easy to use, make it generate queries that are efficient. Um, yeah, so this railway-oriented programming is kind of this idea of, you know how when you have like node where you have like a result or an error, and then if you're composing values of results that could ha be errors, then anytime there's an error, the result of combining a value with another value that has an error is going to be an error. But rather than handling the error at every place where you compose it, you just keep composing them, and when you read the value, it's just going to give you an error. So that's kind of like this idea of doing railway-oriented programming. And it's kind of run that way, because if you imagine there's tracks, where the tracks are your like, data sources, and then every time they merge, they would combine. And then so each time you query something, it could have a value or an error, and you combine them. If either of them had an error, the result would be an error, but you can keep combining them and then check later. And it's not really inefficient, because all it's doing is combining errors and just not really, there are no ops. And that works really well with asynchronous things. So if you can combine asynchronous values, so they're basically futures. So these are future values that will eventually have a value or have an error. And I'm creating another future expression. And Java 8 uh, supports this with the completion stage or completable futures. Um, but just thinking of it in terms of composing future values into these kind of like railway expressions um, is just a way of doing things, which is what I ended up doing when we were doing helpful and just having all these asynchronous things. You just had to imagine in your head, I have all these values and they're kind of like coming down together at these different points. And then also, if you're waiting for values, if you do one query and you get the initial set of values, but then you want to do dependent queries, so it kind of fans out from one result to do parallel async things and they come back together. Um, yeah, so of course you always want it to be fast and use a little memory. Um, yeah, and then just easier than like the DSL type um, ORMs. I just want it to look kind of like SQL. Um, oh yeah, so this is another thing. There was like weird cases where if you have an expression and you say, I want to find rows where this column value is in this parameter that I pass in, and the parameter is a list. But if the list is empty, it generates a query that looks like where column is in and then open close parens, which is invalid SQL. And then so instead of just getting that error, um, it would be nice if it just figured that out and did the right thing. So, oh yeah, so these were some other things that we looked at, juke, 
Yeah, so this looked pretty complex, but it had some of the things, like it was like type safe way of writing queries uh, based on your database. Um, this was like the too, too, too simple one. My Baptist had some kind of XML config, and I was a little bit turned off from it. <laughs> um, but, is, yeah. Okay. All right. <laughs> wow. I didn't. I didn't realize I was that old. Yeah. I was just doing some searches. It came up. I interviewed someone who said they used it, and it's, I looked it up, and it looked kind of reasonable. But yeah. Uh, yeah. So JDBC template. Yeah. It's actually. Yeah. Oh, a different one. Oh. Okay. So you just like doing the interface. Yeah. Okay. Involved. Right. It's like GPA, but this is for I want Spring Data yeah. with block wheel. Oh. That's why it's the Spring Data JDBC only. Okay. That sounds pretty good. So, so other people are working in the same space. They want the same things. Um, yeah. So yeah, medium instruction, like you say, that is a good thing. <laughs> yeah. So the whole Drop Wizard framework. I think it's a pile of crap. <laughs> Not so much the framework itself, but it's so fragmented, the documentation is like really bad, and no one uses it. But JDBI is actually pretty nice. So they have nice docs. Um, it seems to be updated, because they keep updating stuff. Um, so they have like the, this is like the object mapping. Um, and then they added all the extra Kotlin support and all the serializers. Um, yeah, so it seems fairly feature complete. So this is a part that seems useful. Um, right. So, uh, okay, I can read. I can probably just read the GitHub page. Kind of lists the same thing. Uh, I think we covered these points already. Composition of asynchronous results. Batch queries of entities. Oh, yeah, entities and the relationships. So not, sometimes you want to do a join query, but sometimes you want to query the primary thing and then query all the secondary things without using an n plus 1 query. But you want to be able to do it without writing a lot of boilerplate. Um, type safe query composition, mixing. Like if you have bits of SQL and you want to mix it into your typed expression, you want to be able to wrap your raw SQL into a type so you can combine it with other type things. Um, oh, yeah, this part is like, that's on a wish list. So right now, there's no code generator. You have to hand code your schema definition. So I think all of that probably covers all the regular things. Um, oh yeah, protecting against SQL injection. I don't really do anything with that. The library does it for you, <laughs> but may as well list it. Oh yeah, so this is some of the idiosyncrasies of like if it's empty or not empty, you know, do the right thing instead of generating invalid SQL. Another thing that it does is if you have a parameter that you pass in and it's true or false, and you combine it with other literal values of true or false, it'll try to reduce that um, before even giving it to the database. Right, let's look at stuff. Uh, oh, there's an example. Yeah, so here are some simple examples. If you have the accounts table defined, you get this accounts class, and you just say you want this. And that looks a lot like Rails. Um, by default, it's going to be a future, or not default, always. <laughs> um, and then so you call get, or you know whatever you want, to wait for the value. Or you can compose it with other things. So this um, would be an asynchronous, this would be a future value. 
and you can tell the future. Is that how it works? Actually, I might be lying. We have to, we're going to have to look at the code. I forget. <laughs> no, the, the get is from the load projects. Yeah. I don't think that's true. Let's, let's look at the code before I say more lies. A description here? Oh, here, yeah, yeah. So, okay, so subclass of list. For sure, that's not a feature. <laughs> okay. Yeah, but it's it's waiting for the the, the, the it's getting the waiting for load res, load projects. This, this already has a value. Oh, okay. Here, there's a better example. Oh yeah, so if you don't put in the get, you're going to get a future. And so this is basically like list of accounts. So it's a future, and the value is going to be a list. And then, but it has extra methods on it. Um, and then I'm going to say pipeline that, saying the, the result of that is going to go into this function. Right, so effectively, this means wait for this value. When you get it, call this function with the value that you got. And this is going to give me another feature, which is going to be projects. And then so wait for that. And when you get that, call this function. So it's just kind of like uh, using a pipe on the command line. And this is just like a helper thing, because I don't like the way um, Java does the, uh, the completable feature, how you say dot then something something. Their syntax is like really daft. So it's just like a helper library for functions. Um, yeah. So here, let's, what's it doing? So it's getting the accounts. Then we create this pipeline, and this final value that we get out is going to be the, the async value of the last one. So it's going to be the members. And then this, oh, I think that there's a mistake there. I think there's supposed to be an S, isn't there? Because that, that should be multiple. Um, and then here, oh yeah, there's S's missing all over the place. Uh, so this one, oh yeah, so these two are both based on the same value. So it's kind of like we forked from here doing these two in parallel when this value is available. And then I'm going to wait for the admins and members, which is the end of each of those pipelines, by waiting for this and that. Um, okay, so this, so this will wait for two things. Combine will wait for two things, and when it has it, we'll just call the function with those two things. Uh, yeah, so there's some, wait a minute, so that's a big lie. Nobody did that. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, but this is the, oh yeah, see here, yeah, this is all missing. Um, but this is like, yeah, this is still painful right now to have to ha hard code some of these things. Or hand code, rather. Uh, where is this? Fun stuff. Oh, that looks weird. Okay. Okay, so okay, let's see if this works. Run. Oh. Didn't work. Oh, failed. Oh, I probably didn't set stuff up. Oh, that looks incomplete. Uh, da, da. I think I had one that was somewhere else. Yes. Oh, 
Okay. Uh, okay. Let's just look at the code. Um, okay, so here's just a simple query. So that's just saying, do this query, return these objects. Um, it gives me this asynchronous value. And, oh yeah, so join will wait for the value and then just iterate over it. Um, this does the, okay. I think the tests actually have good examples for stuff. Uh, so this is like the low level expression evaluator. So it can do like different kinds of expressions. Um, predicates are just Boolean expressions. And I think somewhere in here, there might be some of the, oh yeah, yeah, here. So <laughs> it has this thing that says for a predicate, if we already know it's false, then we don't have to evaluate the other thing, just return false. So this is where it's gonna short circuit things. Um, so that, and then same thing with the in. So you're gonna have a left thing, which is gonna be like the column name, in, and then the right thing could be your you know, set or list value. And when you do the thing and you know it's empty, then it just resolves to false. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then not does the same, oh yeah, not does the same thing. If you know it's one thing or the other thing, you're just gonna turn it to the other thing. Um, then we have, uh, Ternary expression. Oh, that's probably just a base class for like betweens because you're gonna have like three parts. Is that right? Yeah. So it just generates little query bits. And then here's where it does like a select. We should probably see what, what table definition looks like, because otherwise it doesn't really make a lot of sense. So I think this, oh yeah, so this is the uh, manual table definition. We don't have the generator for this. So basically you have to encode your schema. So we say we have a table. These are the columns. These are the types of the columns. Um, and then so this object with these properties will be what's passed into the JDBI to do the uh, object mapping. And then this accounts thing, right, right, so that accounts type is just a subclass of ArrayList, but it just adds extra members. So if I just want the IDs, it's gonna give me the key set. Um, if I want it by ID, it's just gonna give me a map indexed by its ID. Um, so load projects is just the thing where I can say, given you know, a set of projects, load all of the, or a set of accounts, load all of the projects for all the accounts. So it does the query of accounts. Somewhere here, load projects. Right, so here it does the load of the projects. And once it has the projects, it just connects each project that it fetched to the account. So it just connects them so that once you're there, you can just say account get project. What does that method look like? Where account type do you change? Where? Here? Yeah. Okay. Uh, oh yeah, so this is another thing that um, the relations would have to get generated from the schema. So this is still again hand coded. Yeah, so it's kind of like, I could have picked a language that had more meta programming, but I kind of chose Java because if it works in Java, you can use it from any JVM language. And it's kind of a challenge to do it <laughs> with less. Um, 
And I think there's like statement types. I don't know what else is in here. Oh, here, this is that little async. So it just does all the, the weird dot calls, accept, complete, complete exceptionally, or where's like the chaining? Oh yeah, the thens, the then, then, then. Yeah, so just little helper things. Oh, this is, what is that? Oh, right, so I think this is just the result of like a join. So again, that could be generated. Um, I don't know if there's any other kinds of queries in here. No? It's, oh yeah, so in preparation for this talk, I wanted to dog food this library, and I realized that I don't have any personal projects that warrant needing it. <laughs> Because my data models are so simple, there's like two or three things. Um, I could do anything, I could write the SQL by hand, I could do any, like, I just need like a, a larger project that would make this useful. So, yeah, until then it's just kind of sitting here. But uh, yeah, I mean, the answer to my question is, yeah, you can do some good things and you can get like a nice balance of using something that's typed but looks and feels like SQL and then gives you some decent performance and you know, asynchronous composability. The end. <laughs> <laughs>